listening to Tea with Tolkien, a podcast for the Hobbit at heart. Join us as we chat about the works and faith of J.R.R. Tolkien and strive to carry a little piece of Middle Earth into our own daily lives. This is the fifth in a seven-part book club series on The Lord of the Rings. If you'd like to catch up and start at the beginning, you can just go back to episode one of this season. These episodes will be released on the first of each month now through March to accompany our book club as we are reading The Lord of the Rings together. I know we're almost to the end, but if you would like to join our book club, you can visit teawithtolkien.com slash book dash club. I will be providing notes and kind of like a transcript of this episode to all of our patrons, so if you feel like you'd like to support Tea with Tolkien and you would benefit from having all of these notes in a written form, please consider joining us. You can learn about our Patreon tiers and benefits at patreon.com slash tea with Tolkien. So this month, we are going to be reading and discussing book five of The Lord of the Rings, which is the first half of The Return of the King. So let's just jump in to chapter one, Minas Tirith. After several days' journey, Gandalf and Pippin arrive at Minas Tirith. Gandalf speaks with authority to the men of Gondor, who refer to him as Mithrandir, and he journeys at once to see Denethor, steward of Gondor. They come to find him as he is holding in his lap a great horn cloven in two the Horn of Boromir. At this, Pippin tells all about the death of Boromir, um, and he ends up pledging his service to Denethor as a gesture of repayment for the loss of his son. After all of this, he is sent forth from the hall, and he is eventually accompanied by this guy named Baragond, who is a soldier of Gondor. Pippin eats with him and learns a lot about Gondor and its history and kind of the way they do things around here from Baragond. And then Baragond is like, okay, I'm kind of busy right now, so why don't you go hang out with my son, Burgil, who's about the same size as you. (laughs) Um, He and Pippin become fast friends and explore the city. They venture past the Great Gate, where they see that many men have come to the aid of Gondor, although it does appear to be fewer than everyone had hoped for. As evening comes, Pippin returns to the guest house, where he waits uneasily for Gandalf to return, and then he awakens in the middle of the night to see Gandalf has returned, but he's very distraught and he's just like pacing around and wondering why Faramir hasn't returned to Minas Tirith. When Gandalf realizes that Pippin is awake, he's like, you need to get your rest because you have to go see Denethor in the morning. And then he says, actually, there won't be morning. There won't be a sunrise. The darkness has begun and there will be no dawn. That's quite ominous. There's a lot of tension growing throughout this chapter as the war is coming towards Minas Tirith. Like everyone can see it from far off and it's just getting closer and closer and everyone feels kind of powerless and stressed out as they are awaiting it. As Denethor attempts to conceal his lust for power beneath a cloak of grief, um, Gandalf is coming to Minas Tirith seeking to strengthen Gondor against the coming of war. And as Pippin is welcomed by Baragond and they have a conversation, he begins to understand more fully the depth of Gondor's struggle against Mordor because as Pippin was raised in the Shire, he was completely sheltered from all of this. Um, However, Baragond is rightfully nervous, but the two of them are able to hold on to hope, even though it might be an impossible hope. Baragond says, We have this honor. Ever we bear the brunt of the chief hatred of the Dark Lord, for that hatred comes down out of the depths of time and over the deeps of the sea. Here will the hammer stroke fall hardest. And then later he says, For if we fall, who shall stand? And Master Peregrine, do you see any hope that we shall stand? And then later, Pippin has this really good line. He says, We may stand if only on one leg, or at least be left still upon our knees. Even though there's a lot of tension and despair that's kind of looming on the horizon, Pippin and Baragond, and even Gandalf a little bit, are still kind of holding on to a little bit of hope. Chapter 2. The Passing of the Grey Company. Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, and Merry remain with Theoden after Gandalf, after Gandalf and Pippin's flight to Minas Tirith. So we're back in their point of view. They prepare to depart and ride swiftly through the night, and and it's during this time that they are soon surprised to be met by Halbarad Dunedain, ranger of the north and a company of rangers. At this, Aragorn is filled with joy because 30 of his kinsmen have come to his aid. It's kind of interesting because they're like, we came at your summons, and he's like, I didn't summon you, and then um, it's not really explained after that. They also come bringing a gift from the Lady of Rivendell along with this message. The days now are short, either our hope cometh or all hopes end. Therefore I send what I have made for thee. 
A message has also come from Elrond urging Aragorn to use the Paths of the Dead. Everyone is freaked out by the even even the mention of the Paths of the Dead, and pretty much everyone around him is trying to persuade Aragorn not to do this. However, he knows that this is his path, and it's by taking this path that is his only hope. So after a while, Legolas, Gimli, and the company of rangers pledge to ride along with Aragorn. On their way, they pass through Edoras, where they are greeted and cared for by the Lady Eowyn. Eowyn is distraught over Aragorn's decision to take the paths of the dead, and she wishes desperately to ride along with him rather than to be left behind. If he's going to go, then she wants to go with him. However, he commands her to stay with her people, and he rides on as quickly as he can towards the hill of Eric. They pass through the door, and everyone is utterly terrified, but they are led on by the strength of Aragorn's will. In this, we can see his kingly figure, um, his kingly character. He has captured the hearts and the wills of these people, and they are willing to follow him even into such a terrible place. As they're going on, they soon realize that the dead are following them, and Aragorn calls upon them to fulfill their oath. As they continue walking through the darkness, the dead continue to follow them. Chapter 3. The Muster of Rohan. <laughs> I don't know why this just like makes me think of mustard. I'm sorry. The Mustard of Rohan. So Theoden, the, all of the riders of Rohan, in a very displaced feeling Mary, are journeying towards Dunharo for about three days. Theoden comes to his camp where he is troubled to find Eowyn is super distraught over Aragorn's departure. And Eomir reflects, saying, none now in the land of the living can tell his purpose. So they're all kind of confused and kind of upset, but for the most part, they're trusting Aragorn because they believe that he knows what he's doing, even though Eowyn is super upset because she's totally in love with him. Shortly after this, an errand runner from Gondor arrives seeking Theoden, and he is carrying a red arrow, which is their signal for aid. Theoden commits himself and his riders to the aid of Gondor, and they all prepare to ride into battle. However, um, they aren't able to go as quickly as they would like because they are all pretty weary from battle, and so it's going to take a little bit of time, um, and they still aren't going to have as much men as they had hoped for. At the same time, they're also becoming very discouraged by this unnatural darkness that has come over the land. Tolkien writes that the air seemed brown, um, all things about were black and gray and shadowless, and there is a great stillness. Um, he describes it as like a heavy roof over them. And so this, we know, is the work of Sauron as he's kind of preparing the atmosphere even for his big push for battle. Now, preparing for war, Theoden attempts to ride on with Mary. However, Mary really, 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 really wants to go. And so he says like, okay, you can come with me to Edoras, but you still can't come into battle. And Mary's like, oh, I'll take it. I'm going to go as far as I can with you. Once they get to Edoras, Theoden tries again to leave Mary behind, but a mysterious rider named Durnhelm agrees to secretly bear Mary on their horse. Together, the riders of Rohan pass through the still gray shadow towards Minas Tirith and ultimately war. As Theoden has been preparing to ride to war, he says things like, So we come to it at the end, but at least there is no longer need for hiding. This mounting pressure before the outbreak of battle is itself a trial to those who are called to war. We've kind of seen a bit of it with Pippin as he's experiencing what Minas Tirith is like as they're preparing to be under siege. And then we also see this in this chapter as like everyone's on edge and it's very suffocating almost. Lengthy periods of waiting, preparing, and hiding are exhausting as this doom seems to slowly draw near. But Theoden is kind of remarking that at least they're almost to the end of that. At least the storm is gathering and drawing near and there's just this stillness and dread upon them, but it's almost time. Chapter 4. The Siege of Gondor. Now we're back to Pippin. Pippin awakes to the stifling darkness of morning, and he is summoned to return to Denethor's presence. He is then sent to the armory to receive his gear. Clad in the black and silver of Minas Tirith, he's uncomfortable and filled with gloom, and he's very, very hungry. As he joins Baragon for the evening meal, Pippin finds some comfort in the food and friendship um, but everyone's minds soon return to war when they hear the piercing cry of the Nazgul outside of the wall. Five Nazgul flying upon some kind of like evil dreaded winged creatures are pursuing Faramir and all they can do from their perspective is watch. They see the men so far away they look very small from their perspective. They're riding on horses desperately towards the gates of Minas Tirith being pursued by these horrible Nazgul. Watching from over the wall, Pippin sees Gandalf riding towards Faramir's aid and with him he brings this great power and the Nazgul are fleeing from him. 
Faramir is able to enter the city, and when he does, he's super surprised to see a halfling, revealing to his father and Gandalf that this is not the first halfling that he's seen. He then tells them about how he met with Frodo and Sam, and Gandalf is super troubled to hear that they are taking the path of Kirith Ungol. In this chapter, we really get to see how awful Denethor is to Faramir. Um, he regards pretty much everything he does is less than perfect. He wishes desperately that Boromir was alive in his place. He also calls their plan a fool's hope and advising and said that Faramir should have taken the ring from Frodo and brought it to Minas Tirith where he believes that he could have hidden it. At this point, Gandalf and Denethor are arguing pretty intensely and at last um, Denethor bids everyone to rest before the battle comes upon them. So he's like, get out of my face. Like everyone needs to just calm down before battle. Gandalf and Pippin return to their lodging, where Pippin asks Gandalf about the news they heard. Is there any hope for Frodo, I mean? Or at least, mostly for Frodo? Gandalf put his hand on Pippin's head. There never was much hope, he answered. Just a fool's hope, as I have been told. This is the scene that I think they did really well in the movie. It's really touching and sweet. After that, he's like, wait a second, Gandalf, why do you think that they're following Gollum? And Gandalf replies, I cannot answer that now. Yet my heart guessed that Frodo and Gollum would meet before the end, for good or for evil. Let us remember that a traitor may betray himself and do good that he does not intend. It can be so sometimes. So let's just hold on to that quote as we keep reading. In the early morning, Faramir is sent out to the defense of Osgiliath. Before his departure, Faramir asks his father to think better of him if he should return, and then Denethor is a jerk and he says, that depends on the manner of your return. So if you ever are wondering how to be a good dad, just look at what Denethor is doing and don't do that. Throughout the rest of the day, the men of Gondor are wondering if the riders of Rohan will come to their aid and they aren't very hopeful in that regard. The next day, Gandalf hears that Osgiliath is besieged and he rides towards them to see what's going on. He returns to Denethor with news that Faramir is alive, but quote, pitted against a foe too great. As Osgiliath is taken over by the enemy, Gondor's soldiers march out to aid Faramir and his men in their retreat. So um, at a certain point, they've decided Osgiliath is lost and they're going to come back with as many men as they can um, back to Minas Tirith. Gandalf rides out with them, striking fear once again into the Nazgul, and the men of Gondor are able to retreat back to the gate. Prince Imrahil is carrying Faramir into the city because they had found him wounded on the field. After seeing this, the city falls into a great despair. Not only are they being besieged right now, they've heard no news from Rohan, their captain is laying dying, their city is surrounded by the enemy, and war is on their doorstep. It's, it's begun. The Nazgul encircle the city, filling the hearts of men with terror and hopelessness. And Tolkien writes, For yet another weapon, swifter than hunger, the Lord of the Dark Tower had dread and despair. So right now he's playing mind games with the men of Gondor. In the White Tower, Denethor cries beside Faramir as he apparently lays dying. After he refuses to come down, Gandalf then assumes command of the last defense of the city. However, Minas Tirith is burning and nearly everyone has fallen into despair. Denethor is kind of spiraling into madness and his plan now is to burn himself and Faramir alive. He releases Pippin from his service, telling him to go get out of his face, and Pippin frantically goes off searching for Gandalf. It's at this point that the enemy has broken down the gate with a great ram called Grond, and the black captain is flying in, causing everyone but Gandalf to flee. It's in this moment that Gandalf faces the king of the Nazgul. Tolkien writes, You cannot enter here, said Gandalf, and a huge shadow halted. Go back to the abyss prepared for you. Go back. Fall into the nothingness that awaits you and your master. Go. The Nazgul replies, Old fool, this is my hour. Do you not know death when you see it? Die now and curse in vain. As the Nazgul king draws closer to Gandalf, a cock crows, welcoming morning. And with that, great horns in the north are wildly blowing. Rohan has come at last. I love the way that Tolkien does this scene, as he seems to do often. I feel like once we read a lot of Tolkien, we kind of get this like, oh, the sun, suddenly the sun is coming. Everything is going to be okay. Um, the way that the weather kind of seems to coincide with the battle. Gandalf is like saying, you can't come here. You can't come here. You have no power here. Go out of here. And then the Nazgul is like, this is my hour. But actually it's not. 
Even in all of his power, the Nazgul king cannot conquer against the power of Gandalf. Notice that he halts when Gandalf speaks his command, you cannot enter. This is the power of goodness against evil, of light against dark. We have this juxtaposition. Immediately after speaking, this is my hour, the darkness comes to an end as the sun is beginning to rise, and with it come the riders of Rohan. Tolkien's placement of the sunrise with the coming of the Rohirrim is not coincidental. Obviously, Tolkien seems to do this all the time. The darkness of the Nazgul king's perceived hour has come to an end. Chapter 5, The Ride of the Rohirrim For four days now, Mary has ridden with Durnhelm straight into the deepening gloom. They are now less than a day's ride from Minas Tirith and Moor. Nobody is really noticing Mary, and so he's kind of eavesdropping on all these conversations between Eomir and one of the wild men. Troubled by the darkness, these wild men have come to the aid of Theoden. During this conversation, he also speaks of a coming wind that brings hope, yet it cannot be seen or felt. As they ride into battle, Theoden encourages his men, urging them forth with this short speech, but it's, it's a really good speech. Now is the hour come, riders of the mark, sons of Eorl. Foes and fire are before you, and your homes far behind. Yet though you fight upon an alien field, the glory that you reap there shall be your own forever. Oaths you have taken, now fulfill them all, to lord and land and league of friendship. Forth now, and fear no darkness. They arrive, and they fear that they have come too late, because they see what looks to be a pretty bleak scene. However, Theoden calls again to his men, Arise, arise, riders of Theoden. Fell deeds awake, fire and slaughter. Spear shall be shaken, shield be splintered. A sword day, a red day, ere the sun rises. Ride now, ride now, ride to Gondor. With a renewed hope and filled with the joy of battle, the riders of Roham come to the city as the sun rises and all the hosts of Mordor are filled with terror. Theoden fills his riders with hope and encouragement as they ride into battle, urging them to fulfill their oaths and to attain glory that could be theirs forever, to fear no darkness and to ride for Gondor. He speaks in a loud voice that Tolkien describes, more clear than any there had ever heard a mortal man achieve before, and it's with this call that he leads his men into battle. It's in Theoden that we are seeing an incredibly just and valiant king, even though he had been under such a wicked influence of Wormtongue when we first met him, we've seen in these last couple of chapters how good of a king he is. In contrast to Denethor, who sends even his own sons into deadly peril, yet remains in the protection of his white tower, Theoden is riding before all of his men. Tolkien writes, Behind him his banner blew in the wind, the white horse upon a field of green, but he outpaced it. After him thundered the knights of his house, but he was ever before them. We have this image of Theoden riding forth before his men, and they're all following him into battle, which I think is a really good image of what a king should be like. That stands in pretty huge contrast to what we see with Denethor. Chapter 6, The Battle of the Pelennor Fields As the riders of Rohan come upon Gondor, they find that the assault is being led by the king of the Ringwraith, the lord of the Nazgul, the witch king of Angmar. Seeing the Rohirrim, he seeks out their king, and so Theoden charges to meet them. He pierces Theoden's horse with a black dart and he falls, crushing Theoden beneath him. He then comes to Theoden, wielding a great black mace, but Durnhelm stands between them. Do what you will, but I will hinder it if I may. Hinder me, thou fool, no living man can hinder me, the Nazgul king replies. And it seemed that Durnhelm laughed, and the clear voice was like a ring of steel. But no living man am I, you look upon a woman. Eowyn I am, Eomen's daughter. You stand between me and my lord and kin. Be gone if you be not deathless. For living or dark undead, I will smite you if you touch him. Mary uh, is pretty... <laughs> this kind of reminds me of the way that Superman puts on his glasses and nobody knows who he is. Mary um, doesn't recognize Eowyn because she has a helmet on. So Mary is extremely shocked. However, he's he wants to help Eowyn because he realizes that she shouldn't be alone. She shouldn't be fighting alone. So Mary actually is able to pierce the leg of the Nazgul king from behind him, which causes him to stumble. And Eowyn uses this as an opportunity to drive her sword between his crown and mantle, thus killing the, thus killing the witch king of Angmar, the lord of the Nazgul. And having destroyed her foe, she falls to the ground. So I want to talk a little bit about this whole scene. 
As Eowyn responds to the Nazgul King's taunt, no living man may hinder me, he's filled with sudden doubt. Um, and I've often wondered why revealing that she was a woman seems to cause him to pause. And I kind of wanted to spend a minute digging into this scene. Some have referred to Glorfindel's words in Appendix A as a prophecy in regards to the fate of the Nazgul King. Um, he says, He will not return to this land. Far off yet is his doom, and not by the hand of man will he fall. These words many remembered. However, I'm unsure whether or not he intended this to mean like any sort of prophecy or anything specific to men themselves, or if he just meant it to be understood that he meant the strength of men couldn't conquer the strength of the Nazgul king. Yeah, so I would love to hear everyone's perspective in the Discord. But in the end, the Nazgul king meets the same fate as Saruman and Sauron might in the end. The Nazgul king is a servant of Sauron. And so because of that, he kind of has the same mindset that it's only the great and powerful. He seeks out the king. He doesn't even bother with the rest of the soldiers. He he thinks that only the great are able to destroy him. And it's in his arrogance that he's really brought down. He disregards women and hobbits. He doesn't even realize that they're there. Um, and this is his downfall. And this is kind of the way that all of Tolkien's villains end up falling. It's It's the unexpected hope. The eucatastrophe. This is a little eucatastrophe within the big story, with the destruction of the Witch King of Angmar. Tolkien's heroes are, are always the unlikely, the overlooked, the quiet, and the meek. And I love that he used a hobbit and a woman, two people who weren't even supposed to be on the battlefield in the first place, to bring down the Nazgul King. So I just love this part. So not far from her, Theoden is lying dying, and then Mary comes up to him and he speaks his last words. Then Eomer sees Eowyn fallen upon the battlefield and he freaks out because he didn't realize she was there and he's worried that she's dead. He actually assumes she's dead. After this, he rides towards the city crying, Death, ride, ride to ruin and the world's ending. The battle continues to rage on and it's not looking very good. However, suddenly Aragorn arrives from the path of the dead and following him is this great army of the dead which fills the hosts of Mordor with dread because... They were completely not expecting this at all. After this, the battle turns to Gondor's favor, and though they have lost a great number of their own, they are victorious. So I think this would be a good spot to pause and talk a little bit more about Eowyn, because truly her character is one of my favorites, and I think she's one of the most important women in The Lord of the Rings, really. Since there aren't that many, she's a really good one, and I think we should talk about her for a minute. Tolkien writes a few chapters ago, all your words are but to say, you are a woman, and your part is in the house. But when the men have died in battle and honor, you have leave to be burned in the house, for the men will need it no more. But I am of the house of Aeoral, and not a serving woman. I can ride and wield blade, and I do not fear either pain or death. What do you fear, lady? Aragorn asked. A cage, she said. To stay behind bars until use and old age accept them, and all chance of doing great deeds is beyond recall or desire. Eowyn has lived a life of duty and service and stewardship and caring for her people in the ways that she was permitted as a woman to do. Yet, as the War of the Ring carries on, she's overcome with this desire to fight alongside her kin and friends. I can ride, she says, and wield blade, and I don't fear pain or death. She's begging Aragorn to allow her to follow him in battle. And ultimately, he says no because he wants to keep her safe and protect her, and he also doesn't want to overstep his boundaries because this is kind of something she needs to be talking to Theoden about. But even after all of this, she's been patient and patient and, and obedient and she's done her best. But after a certain point, um, she just decides to ride on and she's without hope and she's really seeking some kind of a glorious death and war because she's so discouraged. By disguising herself as Durnhelm and carrying Mary into battle, she's actually able to serve her people in a way which she never would have been able to do had she remained home. And though she's overcome with despair and a desire for nothing more than death, she brings with her the strength to defend her king. Standing before the Nazgul king, she's prepared to lose her own life for the protection of Theoden, her kinsman and king, and yet with the help of Mary, who is also not supposed to be in the battle, um, they're victorious against such great evil. Her bravery in the battle echoes like a fierceness and a strength of love that we see throughout a lot of other characters in The Lord of the Rings. 
and as an added depth to her character, this imagery of Eowyn as she cuts off the head of the Nazgul King's winged beast, it evokes the Blessed Virgin Mary as she stands crushing the head of the serpent. Now, a few questions that I think would be great for discussion in the Discord. As Mary comes to Theoden as he lay dying, he apologizes for disobeying his orders. However, Theoden replies with grace, saying, Great heart will not be denied. How does this reaction reflect the culture of Rohan? Why do you think Eowyn so greatly desired the chance of doing great deeds? It really seems like that was top priority to her, and I think it would be fun to kind of dig into the culture of Rohan to see why we think that was so important to her. Chapter 7, The Pyre of Denethor. Back in Minas Tirith, Pippin runs to Gandalf, urging him to return to the Citadel because Denethor is planning to burn Faramir and himself alive. They find Baragond as he holds the door against the servants of Denethor who have brought torches to him. Gandalf recognizes that Denethor has gone completely mad. He uses his power to cause his sword to fly from his hands and away from him. Denethor tells them that Faramir is already burning, so Gandalf pushes past him, but he is relieved to find that Faramir is alive and asleep and not burning. Gandalf carries Faramir away from the pyre, and Denethor cries for him, wishing to go into death together with his son. Denethor insists that there is no hope, saying, Against the power that now arises, there is no victory. Denethor is upset because he kind of wishes he could have had things his way. So then Gandalf is like, well, what would you have if you could? And Denethor replies, I would have things as they were all the days of my life. But if doom denies this to me, then I will have not, neither life diminished, nor love halved, nor honor abated. But in this, at least thou shalt not defy my will to rule my own end. Gandalf replies, Authority is not given to you, steward of Gondor, to order the hour of your death, answered Gandalf. And only the heathen kings, under the domination of the dark power, did thus, slaying themselves in pride and despair, murdering their kin to ease their own death. Gandalf is rebuking Denethor for wishing to rule his own end. Rather than clinging to any kind of hope, the steward has succumbed to despair utterly, and in doing so, he wishes to die rather than to see the ruin that he believes is imminent. Gandalf's words in this quote are reminiscent of his counsel to Frodo and the Fellowship of the Ring. After Gandalf recounts the story of Gollum and the ring um, in chapter 2 of the Fellowship, Frodo admits that he feels no pity for Gollum and he believes he deserves death. Gandalf replies, Deserves it? I dare say he does. Many that live deserve death, and some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? Then do not be too eager to deal out death and judgment, for even the very wise cannot see all ends. Gandalf's wisdom and prudential judgment really shine through in both of these quotes, and it's carrying him through these chapters, he recognizes that mankind should not be wary to deal out death and judgment, and that we do not have the authority, and that we do not have the authority to choose our own death. As he says, even the very wise cannot see all ends. In the end, though, Denethor does have his own way. He clasps the palantir in his hands, and he lets the flames take him. Filled with grief, um, everyone carries Faramir out towards the Houses of Healing. And as this chapter draws to a close, Gandalf is looking upon the battlefield and he reflects on Denethor's use of the Palantir and his descent into madness. After that, Gandalf goes down to the battlefield, sending Baragond to the side of Faramir in the Houses of Healing. If we wanted to discuss Denethor's death and his despair and the, kind of the way he went out in the context of Numenor and the way that the kings of Numenor were able to choose when they were finished and they were able to lay down their lives peacefully. Um, I think it would be neat to just kind of talk about the context. I also think this would be a great spot um, for a discussion of the Palantir because there's a lot going on with them and I think we can see pretty clearly that Denethor's obsession with it definitely helped drive him into despair. Chapter 8, The Houses of Healing. Deeply wounded, Faramir, Eowyn, and Mary are brought to the Houses of Healing. In despair, um, one of the women who are, one of the women who is serving in the house cries out, "Alas, if he should die, would that there were the kings in Gondor as they were once upon a time." They say, for it is said in old lore, "The hands of the king are the hands of a healer." At this, Gandalf is like, hmm, maybe I should go get Aragorn, bring him into the Houses of Healing, since he's going to be the king, but we don't want anyone to know yet. 
So Aragorn doesn't want to come into Gondor as king yet. He wishes to remain captain of the Dúnedain, and he doesn't want anyone to really know who he is exactly until Mordor has been defeated. However, once he starts healing people, they kind of figure it out. Aragorn heals Faramir, Eowyn, and Merry with the use of the Athelas plant, and after that, he also works long into the night to heal the other wounded people. At this, many people are marveling at him, and they recognize him as king and healer. He's not really able to heal them and help them without revealing who he is. Tolkien writes, And word went through the city, The king has come again indeed, and they named him Elfstone because of the green stone that he wore. And so the name, I love this part, And so the name, which it was foretold at his birth, that he should bear, was chosen for him by his own people. Aragorn's reluctance to come into the city before the war is over um, calls to mind John's gospel as readers are told throughout the narrative that Jesus kept saying his time hadn't come. The similarities between Christ and Aragorn are striking, and I don't doubt that Tolkien wrote them with intention. As it is said in this chapter, the hands of the king are the hands of the healer, and we are reminded of Christ's miraculous healings throughout his ministry. Aragorn is a man of such humility and prudence. And while other men may have been tempted to flaunt their authority and power or to prematurely come into their kingdom, he's genuinely working towards the good of his people with patience, and he knows that his time isn't quite come yet, and he doesn't want to he doesn't want to be the kind of king who takes the power before the war is over. Chapter 9, The Last Debate Gimli and Legolas join Merry and Pippin, where the hobbits are eager to hear about the paths of the dead. So we've got some friends reunited once again, and they're just going to be like recounting what happened um, as they were separated. While Gimli refuses to tell about the paths of the dead because they were so horrifying, Legolas agrees to because he didn't feel the horrors of it as others did. After this, the captains of Gondor are all gathered together, and it's time for a big debate and time for everyone to discern what their next course of action is going to be. Now that this battle is over, how are they going to continue with the war against Sauron? Gandalf counsels the captains that Sauron is in great doubt, knowing that they have found his ring, and that there are some among them with the strength to wield it. Tolkien writes, His eye is now straining towards us, blind almost to all else that is moving so we must keep it. Therein lies all our hope. This, then, is my counsel. But we must, at all costs, keep this eye from his true peril. We cannot achieve victory by arms, but by arms we can give the ring-bearer his only chance, frail though it might be. Gandalf advises the men to march towards Mordor and to call Sauron out and to empty his lands and to meet them in battle at the Black Gate. Though small in number and weary, they gather their forces and get ready to march towards the gates of Mordor. During this scene, there's this really good uh, quote that I want to pull out. Tolkien writes, Other evils there are that may come, for Sauron himself is but a servant or emissary. Yet it is not our part to master all tides of the world, but to do what is in us, for the succor of those years wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know, so that those who live after may have clean earth to till. What weather they shall have is not ours to rule. So this quote um, reminds me again of Gandalf's, like, we only have, all we have to do is to decide what to do with the time given to us. Like, that's a totally paraphrase. I've ruined it. But he understands that they can't control what things will be like in a hundred or a thousand years from now. All they have to do is choose what to do right now to rid evil as best they can. He counsels the men of the West saying, we cannot achieve victory by arms but by arms we can give the ring-bearer his only chance. By marching upon the gates of Mordor, Sauron's eye will be drawn away from Frodo and Sam, and his lands will be emptied of soldiers, giving them the chance to get to Mount Doom. The fate of the entire world now rests on the shoulders of two small hobbits, yet the part of men is not over. While there is no chance of victory in the battlefield, Gandalf calls for the men of the West to step outside themselves for a cause greater than their own lives, and they accept it. Chapter 10, The Black Gate Opens. I love this chapter's title as it's a nod to the Black Gate is closed in the two towers. So before where we had Frodo and Sam at the Black Gate, now we have the men of the West united and they're preparing to march upon the Black Gate to challenge Sauron in one last battle. Also important to note, 
Mary is left behind at Minas Tirith. He's not too happy about it, but what can you do? After many days of slowly advancing towards Mordor, their dwindled army of less than 6,000 soldiers comes at last to the Black Gate. There they are met by the mouth of Sauron, this evil nasty guy who bears tokens that he was given to show Gandalf. To their dismay, he pulls three items from his black cloth, Sam's sword, an elven cloak, and Frodo's mithril coat. He believes that the halfling was a spy, and he tells Gandalf that he has been taken prisoner. Gandalf asks to hear Sauron's terms, to which the servant replies that Sauron demands a victory and dominion against Gondor and its allies. At this, Tolkien writes that Gandalf, quote, cast aside his cloak and a white light shone forth like a sword in that black place. Before his upraised hand, the foul messenger recoiled, and Gandalf coming seized and took away from him the tokens, coat, cloak, and sword. These will be taken in memory of our friend, he cried, but as for your terms, we reject them utterly. Be gone. At this, the messenger of Mordor is overcome with fear and retreats, signaling for the attack to begin. The men of the west are suddenly surrounded and trapped in a sea of Sauron soldiers. At the outbreak of battle, Pippin stabs a troll and is crushed by it, and as he lays, believing himself to be dying, he hears voices crying, the eagles are coming. And with this, we come to the close of book five. Thank you so much for listening. I will be back on February 1st with the final part of The Lord of the Rings, book six, the second half of The Return of the King. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I would love to hear from you. You can reach me on Twitter or Instagram at Tea with Tolkien or by using the handy dandy contact form on my website at teawithtolkien.com. I look forward to hearing everyone's thoughts in the Discord and um, just seeing how this discussion has continued. This podcast isn't really meant to be a monologue. It's meant to be something that serves as like a springboard for our book club discussion. So I would love to hear from you, hear your thoughts. Um, I just look forward to it. I think it's great. Our book club has been so wonderful so far. So thank you for everyone who's participated. I can't wait to see what everyone has to say about this book. Mm -hmm.